So hello, uh, hello everyone. Um, I know many of you, but uh, not uh, not everyone. So I'm uh, Sean Rehag. I'm the director of the uh, Center for uh, Refugee Studies. I'm delighted that you're uh, here today. It's nice to see um, such a great uh, turnout, and of course, it's because we have a wonderful uh, speaker uh, for our CRS seminar uh, today. Uh, so as you know, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, James uh, Milner uh, today. James is an associate professor at uh, Carleton. Um, he works in uh, political uh, science. He's one of the, the leading thinkers uh, in Canada on the politics of the global uh, refugee regime with a particular interest in um, uh, the politics of uh, asylum in the global south. Uh, and he's going to be uh, speaking to us uh, today about uh, LEARN, the Local Engagement Refugee Research Network. Um, CRS is excited to be a member of that, uh, that network. Uh, I had an opportunity to chat with, uh, uh, with uh, James uh, this morning to hear an update on uh, the really exciting uh, work that the, the network is undertaking. Um, and we're really uh, pleased to be uh, part of that exciting work and uh, pleased that we'll have the opportunity um, to uh, hear uh, a bit uh, more in detail about uh, how that uh, exciting project uh, is going. So James is going to speak to us uh, today, 40 minutes or so, uh, followed by uh, lots of time uh, for uh, questions. So James. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, it's great to see uh, friends and colleagues, so many uh, familiar faces around the table and some new faces. It's a real privilege to be back at the Center for Refugee Studies here at York. Um, the CRS is a really essential community for, for refugee studies in Canada and, and internationally. And so it's a privilege to be able to come and share this work with all of you but really to have an opportunity to share the opportunities that we hope to be creating to ensure that these opportunities get fully realized by this incredible community of partners that we have here at York. So I'm very grateful for the invitation. And I, I do want to begin by, by recognizing that the work that we're doing in the Local Engagement Refugee Research Network really builds from the leadership that has come from York over the past uh, 10, 15 years, if not more. Uh, the leadership of Susan McGrath and a number of colleagues around the table uh, with the Refugee Research Network. I'm glad that Michelle is here because I now have a, a new appreciation that these things don't happen without those who make sure that all of the pieces uh, fall into place and, and that the pieces of the puzzle fit, fit together. So, you know, Learn is, is very excited to be able to continue asking some of the questions that were really provoked and animated by the Refugee Research Network. Uh, and to paraphrase uh, Isaac Newton, I think it was Isaac Newton who said it, that if Learn sees further, it's only because we've stood on the shoulders of, of giants in terms of those who have been engaged with asking these questions for a very long time. And, and speaking of asking these questions for a very long time, I, I do want to begin with the territorial land acknowledgement that York University uh, uses. And I'll, I'll leave it on the screen and give you a moment to read it. I hope you're familiar with it. And I take a moment to share this acknowledgement just out of protocol, but for three very substantive reasons. Um, first of all, the issues that LEARN is engaged with and some of the issues that I'll be presenting during this presentation um, are concentrated within the Global South, specifically in East Africa and the Middle East. But it's important to situate this conversation within a reminder of our own colonial uh, history here within Canada and the process of reconciliation uh, that we're embarked upon. So I don't want to essentialize and to suppose that these issues of dislocation and dispossession that I raise in this presentation are in some way uh, not present on the land on which we gather now. Second, the acknowledgement really uh, prompts me and I hope all of us to rechronitize our inquiry around uh, these issues of displacement. I grew up not far from here uh, and, and playing as a seven, eight year old uh, in one of the parklands around the tributaries of the Don River 
digging in the dirt, I uncovered bits of stone and taking it to a field trip to the Royal Ontario Museum, it was discovered that these stones were actually thousands of years old and it led to urban archaeology project in excavating part of my backyard and discovering that in my backyard there was a migrant camp, a transit camp that had been there 5,000 years earlier. So when we talk about these issues of displacement, it's often framed in this question of crisis and in great immediacy. Human migration is part of the human experience for more than 300,000 years. And the territorial land acknowledgement is an opportunity to appreciate that question of time and of scale. But more immediately within this, and I'm glad that, that Dina is here, that, that some of the work that we have done within LEARN, and I'll be coming back to this within the presentation, I commend to you the paper that, that Dina Ataha wrote uh, for LEARN as we were beginning the work, it really prompts us in our thinking to learn from the conversation around uh, decolonizing knowledge, indigenizing the university, and some of the assumptions that we need to make uh, evident and make visible in our inquiry, especially when we wade into the everyday politics of the refugee regime and research partnerships. So with that, where do I begin this conversation? Where does LEARN situate its work? Um, this is part of a, of a long uh, journey um, that I'll speak to in a moment, but uh, of conversations with colleagues in Canada, within academia, within the NGO community, um, outside of Canada, especially within the Global South, in really understanding what we know and don't know around the politics of this thing called the refugee regime, this set of norms and institutions that was created in the aftermath of World War II to ensure protection for refugees and to find a solution to their plight. And given the glasses that I wear, I can't exactly read what it says on my screen, so I'm going to turn to the notes that I have here, and now it's on video, so for the whole world to know. So there's a lot that we know about the politics of the refugee regime. We know about the politics of asylum in the global north and in the global south, in individual contexts. We know quite a bit about the question of politics uh, at, at, a, at a global scale and how responses to refugees are framed by national and international politics. We know a lot about the, the, the range of interests and, and actors and the factors that condition the functioning of the refugee regime. And we have a really good understanding from research among you know, some colleagues around the table here about how these interests are very much the result of global structures. But within this patchwork of what we know, it raises the question of which actors are engaged in the politics of the refugee regime that we don't understand. Because by just quick analysis, we can say that the knowledge that we have about the refugee regime, however robust, isn't in and of itself leading to the kinds of solutions that we would hope to see. The average duration of a refugee situation, as we know from the work of Jennifer and Winona and protracted refugee situations and others, the average duration of a refugee situation is some 20 years. So the question is, what is an area or what is an area of practice within the regime where new knowledge will help shed light on perhaps new opportunities. And this was the focus of a workshop that we had, and uh, Jennifer and others were there at Carleton University in 2015, really looking at all of the various actors engaged in the refugee regime. And what came from that, it was that we know very little about the role of civil society actors, and especially NGO actors, in the functioning of the refugee regime. And that's surprising. It's surprising for some substantive reasons, and it's surprising for some conceptual reasons. It's surprising for substantive reasons because when we look at the daily practice of the refugee regime, civil society actors are really important agents within that practice. That, you know, back in 2016, 40% of UNHCR's programming was undertaken by over 800 NGOs. And in fact, when you look over the past 10 years, somewhere between 600 and 800 NGOs, international, national, local, that there's this extraordinary grouping of non-governmental actors who are involved as implementing partners, as program partners of UNHCR, that they are present and active in the functioning of the regime. If we look historically, 
back to the early days of the refugee regime, uh, World Refugee Year, uh, the response to uh, three million refugees fleeing Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, the, the, the response of the Indo-Chinese Comprehensive Plan of Action. Civil society has played really critical moments historically in the functioning of the regime and delivering on this promise of protection and solutions. So within the refugee regime, with those norms and institutions, there's, there's a historical and a very contemporary presence. But then if we look at other regimes, like the global environmental regime and the work of Betzel and Carell, they show how civil society actors, academics, NGOs, interest groups, use moral and expert authority to influence outcomes in global policy discussions. That more conceptually, the work of Baines and others talks about civil society as being these drivers of change, the conceptual possibility that comes from understanding the, uh, the function and the nature of civil society, and then going to Gellner's work in the 1990s, understanding that civil society actors are a particular kind of actor. Those actors who are able to come between the state and the private to resist the temptation of states to atomize society, to, 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 to disaggregate society, to be able to control particular interests. So there's a real potential that comes from understanding who are these actors that are involved in these forms of practice, and how can an understanding of their engagement in the everyday politics of the refugee regime not only enhance our understanding of the regime as a whole, but then identify those moments, those spaces, those opportunities where coalitions, where alliances, where partnerships can bring together knowledge and practice, can leverage this moral and expert authority to realize change. Now, some points that I would make about everyday politics is that it, it, it's, it's understood in, in, in different ways within other studies, but certainly within refugee and forced migration studies as a field. So you know, Jennifer and I have been having a conversation about how her work from managing displacement and understanding you know, the everyday politics in a space like Dadaab through this understanding that an individual's body can be a site of everyday politics. And I'm, I, I'm grotesquely paraphrasing, but this notion that everyday politics is not programmatic, that everyday politics occurs, this is an example of everyday politics where we are right now. The meeting of the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva is everyday politics. A meeting of uh, a refugee-led initiative in the Kakuma refugee camp is, an, is a site of everyday politics. So this idea that there are actors that are engaging, that are coming into contact at different moments in different sites within the refugee regime and experiencing everyday politics, that there's a real diversity between those spaces that are governed by the refugee regime, Hillhorst and Jansen and their work on refugee camps, versus Landau and, and Amit's work on urban spaces and how the anonymity of urban spaces and the diversity of actors in urban spaces creates very different power brokers that are able to uh, project different forms of power and how power gets experienced very differently in these different contexts of everyday politics. Again, looking at the general literature and this, you know, Scott's work from 1987 on weapons of the weak really understands everyday politics within development discourse as being these sites and these moments where this moral and expert authority can be leveraged, can be mobilized, can be utilized by actors where there is capacity and where there is access and how there are these competing understandings of exercise of productive power to be able to create competing subjectivities around which outcomes like policy can be realized. But then not to reify particular practices as the sole moments where everyday politics is experienced. And certainly in the migration studies literature in Southern Europe, for example, we see real echoes of Scott's understanding of everyday politics being found in these everyday forms of resistance, non-compliance and foot dragging. You know, the, uh, in, in, in Italy, uh, centers where uh, individuals who have applied for asylum are compelled to take Italian language courses 
how their forms of resistance may be that they arrive for the class, but non-participation in the language training while they're there. So it's within this understanding of a gap that we have and an opportunity that we have that from 2015, 2016 through to 2017, that a group of partners, initially Canadian university partners, uh, NGO partners in Canada, came together to say that sustained partnership research and training and knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization and network development around the question of civil society and the refugee regime will be useful with the goal of understanding and enhancing the role of civil society within the refugee regime. Now very quickly the question then becomes who is civil society? And at the partnership, at uh, the proposal development workshop that we had in 2017, it became very clear that this is a very slippery term. And so over time we began to understand that there are different civil society constituencies and each have different interests, different capacities. There are, there are researchers and research communities in Canada, but in contexts as diverse as Lebanon, Jordan, Kenya, and Tanzania. That there are national research actors who themselves engage in everyday politics and trying to engage in various agendas. There are national NGOs and country offices of international NGO partners. Um, our work in, in Kenya that I'll talk about in a moment has really shown the diversity, the discrepancy of opportunity for these different partners in terms of the asymmetries of opportunities between international NGOs and national NGOs. And then there are refugee-led initiatives, uh, refugee community-based organizations that organize themselves to advocate for uh, participation in processes but also themselves run programming. So collectively, these are actors within civil society that have at different times different interests and different abilities, but together in some way form an ecosystem of opportunity within the everyday politics of the refugee regime. So the focus as this developed was to bring together Canadian university partners, NGO partners, uh, an advisory group that I'll explain in a moment, and working groups in Kenya, Tanzania, Lebanon, and Jordan. And these working groups being comprised of uh, academic partners, national NGO partners, the country offices of our international NGOs, and refugee leaders of refugee-led initiatives within each of these contexts. The origins of this, and I, I won't get into it for the interest of time, but is rooted in an, in, in an MOU that the Center for Refugee Studies and, and Care Canada and uh, and, and Carleton University signed in 2013. It, the proposal was bigger than my doctoral dissertation, so it was a, a big project in, in bringing it to fruition, but we do have now this opportunity of seven years, and we're nearing the end of year two, so we have another five years ahead of us. I won't get into the mechanics of it, I'm happy to come back to this, but I will just explain some of the logic in the way that this is structured in that we have thematic working groups at our Canadian partner universities. So here at York University, Chris Kirikides and Jennifer Heinemann co-lead a working group on intersectionality, there's a group on solutions, a group on protection. But the main agenda setters within our uh, partnership are the geographic working groups based in the four countries where we work within the Global South. So for example, in Kenya, it's a partnership between Moy University uh, the Refugee Consortium of Kenya, a think tank, a refugee-led initiative, um, and the National Office of Care, uh, Care Kenya. The idea is that it's these geographic working groups, these national working groups, that identify needs and opportunities to which the partnership as a whole can respond. We have four core program areas, which are to undertake comparative studies, uh, to do research sub-projects around issues of efforts to implement global refugee policy and local context to be able to understand those moments of everyday politics, to uh, provide capacity building and training opportunities, to develop new knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation activities, and to support the development of sustainable research ecosystems to support this work going forward. Now, I can go into a lot of this but when I had a conversation with, with Jennifer and others that we realized that there is a real disciplining tendency 
of these large grants, yes, to have you know, clear progress indicators and goals and objectives, and I'm happy to talk about all of that, but I think what is more critical is to situate the work that LEARN is endeavoring to do within these longer term conversations about power. And this is where I commend to you the paper that, that Dina wrote as part of the three papers that sought to stimulate or animate the work of LEARN in our first year. It's on LEARN's uh, web uh, site and the, the, the link will be up in a moment. But it made clear that what we are trying to do is very much part of, or perhaps the next step in, conversations about power in research partnerships that have been ongoing. We perhaps have a better understanding now of the questions that need to be asked, but the answers are far from clear. And so what we're now doing with LEARN in, in May of 2020 with our annual meeting that will be in Amman, in Jordan, the idea of taking our annual meetings out of the Canadian context and into the Global South context in alternating years will be coupled with a workshop uh, designed and, and run by Maha Shoyeb, uh, uh, Dr. Maha Shoyeb, the director of the Center for Lebanese Studies at Lebanese American University, that will respond to these questions of asymmetries of power and the inherently political nature of these relationships from the perspective of the Global South. And it's an incredibly exciting moment where we're able to, through LEARN, engage with questions around the political economy of knowledge production. So to recognize, and we've done a study uh, in, in 2018, 80% uh, of the world's refugees were in the Global South. But when we looked at the 10 major outlets of published research on refugees, when we look at the literature, 92% of articles or book chapters in the literature in that same year were from authors based in the global north. You know, our partners have identified these real barriers. There's no absence of knowledge within these communities of practice. It's the question of if and how that knowledge finds its way into this legitimized artifact that we call the academic publication. And perhaps whether it should find its way into that legitimized artifact. But one of the requests from the partners is, are there ways to overcome these barriers of access? And so one of the things that LEARN has done is, is, is with McGill Queens University Press, is launched another series in Refugee and Forced Migration Studies, but with funding and a specific mandate to create opportunities for partners in the Global South to be able to publish in a North American University Press book series. So one of the questions that I would want to raise to you for discussion after the presentation is the question of how you have experienced the political economy of knowledge production and if there are lessons that we can take into account as we move forward uh, within this conversation within LEARN. But more generally, and, and the book by, by, by Susan McGrath and Julie Young with contributions of a number of you around the table coming out of the, the RRN experience, and the, the, the chapter by Lauren Landau that I was reading again on, on the flight down this morning, gives us this real sense of how, how omnipresent power is within these relationships and how LEARN has very consciously tried to reflect these lessons in being clear about who sets the objectives, who sets the agenda, who sets the priority, who allocates resources, in trying to uh, ensure that the activities and the priorities respond not to what the Canadian university partners identify, but what partners in the geographic working groups in Kenya, Tanzania, Lebanon, and Jordan, the priorities that they identify, but the opportunities that they see in linking with partners in our Canadian universities. So Dagmar, who's with us today, it, uh, it, Dagmar is, is one of a number of partners that, that has collaborated with, with Del Delphine Cash at the University of Ottawa, with Francois Crapeau at McGill University, with Maha Shuyev with our Lebanon Working Group, to say there's support that LEARN can give to bring together a group that's able to engage in inquiry in who constructs the label vulnerable in the Lebanese context. 
You know, who has that labeling, that productive power? What consequences does this label of vulnerable have? But for Learn to be able to say that that's an opportunity, not that I've identified, but an opportunity that our partner has identified, is that going to move us further along in this conversation of recognizing, of, of, of illuminating, and hopefully in addressing these real asymmetries of power that come from where resources are allocated and held, and how the management of those resources can address some of these uh, some of these dynamics. Um, in the end, I, I will take time to do this because I think it's quite important. But something that we've also observed is, you know, in, in Barnett and Duval's work on power and global governance, they talk about different forms of power: there's coercive power, institutional power, structural power, but most compelling, I think, is this notion of productive power. Who has the moral and expert authority to create truth, to be able to create subjectivities? Um, the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva was this extraordinary moment where there were 3,000 delegates who were there, each vying to deploy productive power to identify priorities, to be able to set the agenda. But the question is, which of those actors have the standing, have the, the, the backing, have the perceived legitimacy to be able to play that agenda-setting role? Uh, LEARN worked with the global refugee-led network in launching their guidelines on meaning, meaningful participation of refugees within these global processes. But advocating for the involvement of refugees in this global process and getting them on a panel with the World Bank, you know, there are seats at the table for different partners, but how those the power that's manifest within occupying that place differs between different actors is, is, is quite unsettling. Something I'll come back to in a moment. But then going back to, to Dina's paper again, that, that, that even with all of these questions about the political economy and research partnerships and productive power within global settings, we need to stop and ask whether we should be participating within those settings, whether by participating we reinforce these categories and these policy trends that are derivative of the interests of particular actors in the functioning of this regime. Um, I never thought that I would quote Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park, the movie, but there's a moment in Jurassic Park where they brought dinosaurs back with the DNA you know, encased in amber, and all of a sudden, dinosaurs are marauding across the island, and there's a moment where one of the scientists said, we spent so much time wondering if we could, that we didn't take the time to ask if we should. So how do we ensure that we have that moment of pause, and while we work to create these sustainable, vibrant, dynamic ecosystems of partners and partnerships, how do we ensure that we don't unconsciously do that in a way that reproduces those structures of inequality that we're trying to undo? Now, my hope is that part of what we've been able to do over the past 18 months, and here I'm in the home stretch before we turn, we turn to questions. My hope is that, that what LEARN has tried to do is to be quite honest in terms of the limitations that we have, but the real privileged opportunity that we do have. And the way that we have undertaken these early activities has been an effort to do things differently, to not reproduce those asymmetries. But then at the same time, we realize in hindsight, provides an opportunity to reflect on the experiment. So with each of these areas of program activity, there's now been this reflection on how it went in our first year of doing, and how that experience not only allows us to improve the way we do that work in subsequent years, but also then to reflect back on these critical questions of power. So there are four program streams that we have. First on research, one of the main areas of activity have been research subprojects. 
where our partners in uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Lebanon, and to a certain extent Jordan, uh, have identified areas where they would like to collaborate on sub-projects or pilot projects to engage in an area of inquiry that may lay the foundation for them to develop that area of work. Um, you may recommend uh, recognize Mohamed Wale up on the top picture on the right hand side. One of the seven students selected for the first cohort of students. But what's critical about this is that it's not a research agenda that's set by our Canadian partner universities. It's by our partners within the countries where the sub-projects take place. The design of the research, the conducting of the research, the analysis of the results, the production of the working papers that will be coming within the next few months. The principle is that each stage in the, in the, in the research is undertaken collaboratively between a Canadian student and a, and a student situated within the context where the research is taking place. So in the bottom photo, we see Leonard and Witness from the University of Dar es Salaam working with Merve and Stephanie on issues of localization and legal empowerment in Tanzania. So the idea that the, the agenda is set, the research is developed, the research is undertaken, and the significance of what's found is co-created, but the knowledge is not appropriated. Uh, something we're very excited about is at the ISFM conference in Ghana in 2020, if our proposals are accepted, that it will be the opportunity for our student teams to be co-presenting their research. So one of the challenges has been that research is undertaken, and I've, you know, mea culpa, I've been, you know, I, I, I represent this most heinous trend of researchers from the Global North, North going to the Global South, conducting research, bringing the results with them, in launching their academic career. How do we arrest that trend by creating opportunities for students and emerging scholars both in Canada and in the Global South as well? Oops, skip one. In our, our training and capacity building, a real priority that was identified by partners is to have summer courses within the Global South. So while the summer course uh, here at, at York University at the CRS plays a vital role in conversations in Canada and across spaces and other summer courses as well to recognize that regimes like visas, that the cost of travel is a barrier to participation. But also by virtue of having these week-long summer courses within the Global South, it situates those conversations in a different context. But it also creates the space for new kinds of conversations to have our summer course in, uh, in Kenya with partners like Urub al Abed, who came from Jordan, and yes, Jeff Cripps from, Chris from Oxford, but Jane Mary Rahundwa from our Tanzania working group, Joe Kelsey from the Lebanon working group, having partners brought together in the most exciting conversations were actually between participants within the Global South, sharing the experience of Jordan versus Kenya, Tanzania versus Lebanon. So how that creates a different kind of space and how we seek to re replicate that uh, in, in the context of, of the Middle East, hopefully, Beirut in 2020, we shall see, but certainly within the context of the Middle East in 2020. And the idea of creating this as a pathway where our partners control or, or, or design a curriculum and the material and the readings that they identify as being critical and important. Knowledge mobilization has been um, the bane of my existence. <laughs> um, I thought it was going to be so easy, but the thought and care and time that's needed, not just in ensuring that the details of the work are shared, but that the research is translated in a way that is useful, usable, and then ultimately used by partners not just in context, but it, at scale as well. So the idea of trying to leverage our networks to create opportunities like the event in Geneva at the Global Refugee Forum where you know, our Maha from our Lebanon group and Jane Mary from our Tanzania group and uh, in, uh, Pascal who leads a refugee-led initiative in Kakuma, that they were able to present their perspectives on the localization of knowledge in refugee studies so that there are platforms and opportunities that can be created 
but really in consciously trying to identify where there are barriers to access within this thing that we call the literature and how we can advocate and help achieve a greater diversity of voices within that literature, ever mindful of whether or not that's a good thing to do. But then very much for this idea of what constitutes knowledge and what are the forms of knowledge that are going to be useful in each context, we had a partner from our, our Lebanon group, Hisham Kayed, from the uh, in, in national NGO uh, El Jana. Uh, he's a filmmaker and an activist, was in Ottawa for four days in October, and talked about the forms of knowledge that would have the greatest impact are photographs taken by children. Refugee children taking photographs of their daily life that they produce in a glossy book in the Lebanese context. But if we could get that produced through the McGill Queen series and in chapters, bookstores, or on Amazon in time for the holiday season, what does that do in terms of engaging with popular perceptions or conceptions of childhood in the context of exile? So to be very mindful of, as a Canadian academic, what constitutes knowledge mobilization for me may not be the valued knowledge mobilization of our partners. Sustainability has been uh, you know, a, 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 a priority that emerged at our first partners meeting. It has been very much animated by the introduction from Susan McGrath and Julie Young in their edited collection, the work of Lauren Landau and others, but we were told from the outset, you have this opportunity of seven years. At the end of seven years, don't be at the point where you say, that was fun, let's put the chairs back on the table, see you next time. Success is that my role as project director becomes less and less essential. Where ideally we get to the end of seven years and the ecosystems in the countries where we work no longer need partnership to survive. That they have the ability and the means to define for themselves what sustainability means. I'm delighted that Richa Shivakati, who's here with us today, who's the research officer on, a, on an initiative that we've launched with LEARN, and see Susan McGrath and, and Lauren Landau there. This is a 12-month initiative where we've just ended phase one, where we've conducted interviews with more than 20 research leaders from the Global South in their understanding of what <coughs> constitutes success, their understanding of what constitutes impact and sustainability. And from that, to be able to work with the International Development Research Center in forms of support that can lay the foundation for these sustainable ecosystems in different contexts within the Global South. And then over time, to bring those opportunities to scale. The hope is that we'll be developing these and to be able to share them at our annual meeting in uh, Amman in May 2020. But come to ISFM, and if our proposal is accepted with the wisdom with the wisdom of the selection committee for ISFM, who I hope is watching right now. I'm pointing at the camera, not anyone sitting at the table. Our hope is that at that, uh, at that meeting, that we'll be able to share this proposal of how we can take that next step in the meaning of research partnerships. But the last substantive area that I really want to highlight is the great excitement around opportunities that have been expressed to us on questions of refugee participation. Uh, at the CARFUMS conference in Ottawa in May 2018, uh, Osama Salim, one of the members of the Network for Refugee Voices, gave one of the keynote addresses at the conference, <clears throat> talking about the importance of, uh, of alliances between refugee, individual refugees, refugee leaders, and refugee-led initiatives with research communities, with policy communities, to be able to advocate for change. That conversation led to um, the Network for Refugee Voices offering to be part of LEARN's uh, uh, advisory committee. And the two representatives of the Network for Refugee Voices, Mustafa Ali and Musma Durid, playing a very active role in shaping and guiding LEARN's work to ensure that refugees themselves are very actively involved in the decision-making processes within the working groups and in our annual meetings as well. And they very much uh, hold us uh, to account on this commitment. 
But what has been quite exciting is what has happened where there is this partnership with research actors where we've been able to mobilize a knowledge base around not just that refugee participation uh, is the right thing to do in a, in a normative sense, but it's a good thing to do in terms of the outcomes of the policies that result from that process. And with a policy dialogue that LEARN held with the Refugee Hub at the University of Ottawa with a range of partners in September 2019, produce an outcomes document which is on LEARN's website that led to a conversation with the Government of Canada that moved forward this idea that when Canada goes to global meetings on refugees, maybe we should have a refugee seat as part of that delegation. And it happened. So there on the screen you see Canada's uh, Minister of Immigration, Marco Mendicini, giving Canada's statement in the plenary of the Global Refugee Forum. And there sitting next to him is Mustafa Alio, refugee advisor to the Canadian delegation at the Global Refugee Forum. Now there have been refugees on delegations before. Canada's former Minister of Immigration was himself a refugee, but the idea that there is a seat in the delegation for an individual not to represent an, a, a, an institutional perspective, but the perspective of refugees themselves, is exciting. It's a very small step, but it's a potentially exciting step. Now there's a whole series of questions about legitimacy, accountability, representation. All of these questions that now need to be asked, how do you ensure that that seat is filled by someone who's not being tokenized? Right? Someone who is able to say that they speak for this extraordinary diversity of perspectives and experiences that comes from the refugee experience. That to not to singularize that experience, which again is something that Dina's paper makes very, very well. So there is this opportunity that we now have. Um, uh, you'll be able to join us by Zoom on the 30th, because we now have Zoom. So we're able to sort of bring people in virtually around on Twitter. You'll be able to see uh, that LEARN is hosting a meeting on the 30th of January with Mustafa and with Musna to talk about where we go next in a partnership that can unpack these questions of participation. But then practically how we move forward, and the proposal from Mustafa and Musna that came out of that meeting in September 9, 2019, is to have a, a, re, a, a mentorship program. And so LEARN is able to support a certain number of places or participants at the York Summer Course. And so there'll be a process that we'll develop now in selecting six refugee leaders to be able to attend the Summer Course as part of their development in their knowledge of the lexicon to be able to engage with these kinds of opportunities. I wanted to end at 20 after 1, so here are my preliminary conclusions. We've only been doing this for 18 months, so we have five and a half years ahead of us. And as I said, that really this is not just motivated by these questions of power that have brought us to this point, but in our practice, can we interrogate those opportunities? Can we learn from this experiment to be able to advance our understanding of power asymmetries, to address those asymmetries, what they mean, but then to develop partnerships that are more responsive, that are more principled, that are more sustainable, that are more reflective of the principles that we collectively would want to see reflected. It's quite clear that this frame of everyday politics is useful but also unsettling. That when you engage with notions of everyday politics, all of a sudden, you know, making a cup of coffee in the morning becomes political. That all of a sudden you see that these dynamics of power and diversity of opportunity and asymmetries of, 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 of authority, that they manifest themselves in every moment of action. And so how can we be aware of these moments of everyday politics across scale? That there was a tendency in the early work to say that, you know, Geneva is a, is a technical bureaucratic moment of governance and everyday politics is in Kakuma. Well, let me tell you, the everyday politics in Geneva is as reflective of power relations as it is anywhere else within the world. 
Second, to recognize that there are, despite these structural parameters, there are moments of triumph of civil society actors. If you allow yourself to have a more ecumenical understanding of what constitutes success. So for our partners in Tanzania, for example, the fact that they are able to still get a meeting with the Minister of Home Affairs, even though most of their programming has been delayed, for them that's success. Because it's the ability to sustain dialogue when others can. So to have measures of success that are reflective of that environment. To recognize that there is a risk in homogenizing civil society, that there's a need to to really understand the diversity of perspectives and experiences within civil society, that we shouldn't impose methodological frames that seek to make everyday politics tidy to facilitate positivist comparative research, allow that messiness to shine through, that there are real unique insights that come from a, a more fully partnered approach through the full cycle of programming. And really is this, is this question of trust, being what it takes to build and maintain trust um, on very you know, pedestrian questions around the date of a meeting or the willingness to be the one who gets up early for a Skype call as opposed to stay in the office late. But within that building of trust, it's how do we create a space where there is a willingness to take risks and, and fail. And from that inability to do what we said to do, to see that as a learning moment, and not to use the term failure in a very programmatic way. But then the last preliminary conclusion is the more we do this work within LEARN, the more that we realize that we're far from, certainly not the first, and we're certainly not the only ones to be asking these questions. And so to not uh, monopolize or to not sort of delineate this space, but really to be in a constant process of reaching out and learning, and to be comfortable with the discomfort that comes from the ambiguities that arise the more that we do this work. But with that, it is uh, 20 after 1. I do want to leave ample time for discussion. There's quite a bit that's coming soon, and follow us on Twitter, uh, our, our, our Facebook is our, our, our website is getting better. There's a newly launched uh, student network Facebook group uh, as opportunities for uh, a, a broader range of, of students at our partner universities and elsewhere to engage with this. We're looking to take the training, the fieldwork training that we ran, our in-person training, and, and develop that into a blended online opportunity to benefit more students that will soon be advertising research placements in Kenya and in Lebanon. Our annual meeting and our workshop on power and research partnerships will create new products that we'll be posting and sending out by Twitter and our National Institute in Lebanon. Uh, if you're in Beirut in August, let us know. Thank you.